again, glad to have you back. This video is about the measuring the acceleration of gravity, and more specifically, measuring the acceleration of gravity using a pendulum. Now we all pretty much know that the acceleration of gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. But how do we know that? I know, some professor told you. But clearly, it had to be measured. And there's lots of ways to measure acceleration of gravity, and lots of people have tried different things. So we know very, very closely what the actual number is. How would you measure the acceleration of gravity? Well, when I ask my students, usually the answer I get is, well, I'm going to drop something and I'm going to time it. And that'll certainly work, assuming you take into account air resistance and a few things. But dropping things is, is hard to do in an experimental setup. You have to be able to measure things that are going really fast, or you have to be able to measure things that are happening very quickly. Well, neither one of those is very easy to do. Another way to do it is to uh, measure the acceleration of gravity using a simple pendulum. Okay? Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you the equations for a simple pendulum, then I'm going to show you how to make one, and I'm going to show you some data that came from that simple pendulum. Okay? So let's start with the math first. I'll draw one out and I'll show you what the equation of motion looks like, and more specifically I'll show you that the frequency of a pendulum, or the period of the pendulum, is related to the acceleration of gravity. So we'll have an expression with a bunch of things we can either measure or already know, and the only unknown will be g, the acceleration of gravity. So here we go. Let's take a simple pendulum. And when I mean simple, I mean there's, there's only one pivot point on it. Okay. So what I've got here is I've got a pivot right here and I've got an angle theta. Right? Now this, is, this uh, uh, pendulum weight here, it's actually called a bob, but the weight there on the pendulum is considered to be massive and small. Small so that the uh, mass moment of inertia of the pendulum is small enough to be ignored. We don't have to worry about the mass moment of inertia. We're assuming this string here is light and it's rigid enough that the pendulum doesn't change size, it doesn't stretch as the pendulum moves back and forth. In fact, it's so light we get to ignore the mass. All right? So we've got theta there. Other thing we need is a length, L. So I've got that. All right. Now what force is acting on this? Clearly the only thing available is the acceleration of gravity. Well, let's see, the force of gravity is there, and that's mg. By the way, the mass of the pendulum is m. All right. And I'm going to break that down into two components, one of them parallel to the string and one of them perpendicular to the string. Well, the one parallel to the string is m g cosine theta, and the one parallel to the string is mg sine theta, like that. Well, there's no change in length. That was one of the initial assumptions, so I really don't care about that. There's also uh, going to be some centrifugal force, but I don't really care about that either. This is the term I care about. I'm interested in the motion this way. I'm working in polar coordinates now. right? So. If you remember, Newton's law says the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Well, the rotational version of that expression looks like this. The sum of the external moments equals the mass moment of inertia times angular acceleration. Mass is an object's resistance to acceleration. Area moment, I'm sorry, mass moment of inertia is a measure of the object's resistance to rotational acceleration. Right? Well, that's what that is. And that's really I theta double dot. That's the second time derivative of theta. All right? Well, there's only one external moment here, and that's going to be mg sine theta times L. Okay? So there's a force times a distance. That's a moment. Now, also, we've got to have a positive sign convention here. The way I've gotten this drawn, okay, that's my positive rotation sign convention. Well, this is actually pushing the other way, so I'm going to put a minus sign in there. Okay. Well, the area, I'm sorry, the mass moment of inertia of this string is considered to be zero, and the mass moment of inertia of the bob itself is zero. The only mass moment of inertia term I've got is the fact that it's, it's uh, rocking back and forth, oscillating um, at a distance L from that pivot. And you go look this up if you want. That term is ML squared, and I'll bring the theta double dot down. So there we go. That's actually a differential equation. All right. There's there's the derivative right there, and there's some stuff over here. Um, this is a nonlinear equation because that sine theta is there. Now that sine theta, if you don't know enough about calculus, don't worry. This term right here makes that differ differential equation particularly difficult to solve. 
Well, the way we can get around that is to assume small angles. Now, I did a small angle video a little while ago, so you can go back and check that if you like. But if, if the angle is small, if theta is much less than 1, that less than, less than sign means much less than 1, then sine theta is approximately theta. So I'm going to throw that in here, and I'm going to say minus mgl theta equals ml squared theta double dot. So there you go. Right? Now that's a whole lot easier to solve. I can also cancel the masses out, and I can cancel one of the L's out. So I have negative g theta equals L theta double dot. Right? Now, this is about as simple as differential equations get. There's one more thing we can do here. Now, because this has a double dot term there, second derivative, and then just a regular uh, theta right there, not taking no, no derivative there, we know from experience and from previous mathematical work that this is going to move sinusoidally. Well, if we make that assumption, if we say that theta is some amplitude times sine omega t, right? That's what sinusoidal motion is. I already know that that's going to be the answer to that equation. All I got to do is substitute theta or this expression in everywhere I see a theta. That's what a differential equation is. Um, you're trying, you have a differential equation, you're trying to find a function that makes that equation true. The solution to a differential equation is a function, not a number. And that's what the function's going to be. So just to carry this out, theta dot equals omega a cosine omega t and theta double dot is minus omega squared a sine omega t. And that's just because of how the derivative of sine and cosine work. So when I plug all that in here, I'm going to get, let me erase this. I'll make some more room for myself. Go back up here. My, my differential equation now is minus g a sine omega t equals minus omega squared a sine omega t. Did I get that right? Yeah, I got that right. Nope, there's an L in there somewhere. Omega squared L a, there we go. Now I got it. All right? Well, I can cross that out it's on both sides. So I have minus g equals, sorry, omega squared L. Well, that's awfully easy. There's g. There's the thing I want to know. And there's an omega squared right there. That's a frequency. Well, I ought to be able to measure that. And there's L. Well, if I've got a yardstick or a meter stick or a tape measure or something, I can certainly measure that. One last thing. Omega equals 2 pi f. I don't know about you, even though omega is uh, mathematically what we should use there, that's in radians per second, I'm much more comfortable working with cycles per second. I know how to measure that much better than that. So what I got now is g equals, let's see, 2 pi f, all that stuff squared, times l. Well, that's easy. So here we go. 4 pi squared f squared l. I now have an expression where there's something I don't know on one side, that's g, and there's a bunch of stuff I either know or can measure easily on this side. Well, that's good. Notice the one term, one expression, or one uh, parameter that does not appear here. Mass isn't in there. It doesn't matter what the pendulum weighs. Well, this is great. That's one worthless thing I've got to measure. I don't need to weigh the thing. If you don't believe me, go look at a uh, uh, playground and uh, Watch a bunch of little kids on the swings. The swings are usually mostly about the same size, so find one where the swings are all the same length. And if you watch, now the kids won't all be in phase with each other, they might be doing this, but the frequency for all the kids is about the same, because no matter whether they're big or little or skinny or fat or whatever, their center of gravities are all in about the same place, so L is about the same for all of them. Check it out. I bet you find I'm right. Okay, so there we go. All I've got to do now is make a simple pendulum, measure F and L, and I can figure out G. So here's what I'm going to do. Let me uh, erase all this stuff to make a good background. Maybe I'll leave that there. Um, time to make a simple pendulum. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is right there. I need a pivot. So I made a little block of wood here. All right, a little block of wood, and I put a little screw in the end of it to make a, a pivot point. And I stuck a magnet on the back so it'll stick to my board. And I've got some other little magnets here to hold it in place. And I need a uh, string that won't stretch. Now you can't really see this, but this is a piece, I don't know if you can see this, probably not, 
this is a piece of fishing line, and for a mass, I've got, let's see if I can get, there we go, I've got a 9 volt battery. Now, it's massive, it's dense, that's good, and it's real small, so its area or its mass moment of inertia is low. So all i got to do is stick that up here, like that. Can you see that? That's out of the frame, so let me push this way up there. There. I love those magnets. And there's my battery, and you can just see that swinging back and forth. Okay. Actually, it's a little, it's a little bit out of the frame. So I'm going to go ahead and just shorten my string here a little bit. There. Okay. So there. Now you can see everything, right? Now we assume small angles, right? So when I measure this, I can't go all the way over here and go all the way over there. That's a big angle. In fact, let's measure this from right there. There's pretty much uh, my, my pendulum at rest. If I pull it over here like this and let it go, all right, you can see it's moving nice and slow. And if I want to time it, well, it's, it's easy to make an, an error when you're timing only one oscillation. But if you time a bunch of oscillations, a lot of the errors either average out or they're distributed over enough oscillations, it's not a big problem. So if I were to do this, say, ready, go. One, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. Okay? A cycle is to go from here to here and back. Okay? So, um, I'd rather than have you watch me measure some data, I measured some data earlier um, when this was a little longer, okay, before I tied the knot in it. Plot my stopwatch. So 10 cycles, and that took, let's see, 18.8 .8 seconds, if I remember right. Yeah, 18.8 .8 seconds. Okay, and my length, before I tied the knot in my uh, pendulum here, was 876 millimeters. Okay, if I have 10, uh, 10 cycles in 18 seconds and I want to know how many seconds per cycle, all I got to do is divide between my frequency, okay, which is in cycles per second, so 10 over 18.8, that's going to be about a half, 0.5319 hertz. Okay, plug that in and I got an estimate of G of 9.787 meters per second squared. Okay, that's not too bad for sticking a piece of fishing line to a, a block stuck to my board. The longer your pendulum is, the slower it's going to move and the less error there's going to be in uh, measuring the time. The longer the pendulum is, the smaller an angle you can use. Okay, And so you're closer and closer to that small angle approximation. So make a long pendulum, take lots of cycles, and you try it. You see if you can get 9.81. Um, my students routinely get within about a percent or half a percent of the standard answer. Works for them, bet it'll work for you.